Hey everybody, Aaron Bishop here. I just wanted to let you know I have written a book. It has been published and it is available now on Amazon.com. The name of the book is The Power of Passover, A Christian's Guide to the Festival of Redemption. If you want to know what Passover is about, just a really deep dive into the festival, into its history, and into why we're where we're at today. And even an instruction guide on how to hold your own Passover. It's got everything in it. So if you'd like to check that out, go to Amazon.com and search for The Power of Passover. And now we return you to your regularly scheduled program. I was raised to believe that the Bible defines good and evil for us within its pages. But when we stop and examine this idea using the Bible, we discover something else. In the Garden of Eden, there were two trees. A tree that would bring life to all who ate of its fruit and a tree that brought death. And it was the second tree, the tree that resulted in death, that contained the knowledge of good and evil. Have we been deceived by the serpent who is trying to get us to eat of the second tree? Is the Bible really trying to define good and evil for us? Let's take a step back. Let's run an experiment. Instead of seeking to define good and evil, let's instead ask the question of the trees. Let's attempt to define life and death but to do so, we must first seek it out. So join us as we Deresh Chai, as we seek life. Hey everybody, welcome to the Deresh Chai Experiment, the show where we examine the shadows of Scripture in the light of Messiah to discover what they can teach us about Him. This week we begin the end of the book of Exodus. And make no mistake, we are still in Exodus. The same book with the plagues and the parting of the sea and the giving of the manna and the Ten Commandments and so much more. And yet, for the entirety of the rest of the book of Exodus, we will be reading of what is commonly seen as boring blueprints for a building that we will never really get to see. Instructions for how to make garments that we will never get to wear. Instructions for incense that we will never get to smell. And oil that we will never touch. All for a type of worship that we will never get to experience. The fact is that it is very easy to get bogged down in the instructions to come. It's easy to get bored, to question, in fact, why these blueprints are even included in Scripture. What can we learn from these that have any kind of impact in any way in our own lives? Well, that's what we're going to be exploring for the next several months. For the next 12 weeks, we will be in the book of Exodus still, and for the vast majority of this, we will be speaking of the tent itself, the tabernacle, or the dwelling place as it's called, the items in the tent, the clothing of the priests, the role of those who serve in the tent, and the role of the layman in relationship to the tent. But our discussion of this tent will not finish with the book of Exodus. For the first several chapters of the book of Leviticus, we will continue to speak of the service in the tabernacle, specifically the sacrifices and the duties of the priests. Then we'll speak of the status effects that a person has that might prevent them from entry into the tabernacle. We'll speak of the cleansing of the tabernacle and its instruments, and much more. In fact, we will not finish our study of the various and many aspects of the tabernacle for nearly six months. And if you tune in each week, you will, by the end of this, you will know the tabernacle better than some teachers. And yet, in this time, we will not be able to cover everything. So just realize that this topic of the tabernacle will continue for quite some time. And so it's important for us to recognize that each and every piece of the tabernacle is itself a parable, a shadow, and a pattern of something that we can reflect on and used to foster our own growth. For this building, it's more than simply a building. It's more than a tent. It's more than simply a place of worship. It is, as the author of Hebrew puts it in Hebrews 8, verses 4 through 5, If indeed we were on earth, he would not be a priest, since there are priests who offer the gifts according to the Torah, who serve as a copy and a shadow of the heavenly, as Moses was warned when he was about to make the tent. For he said, See that you make it all according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. The priesthood and their service is here called a shadow and a copy of a greater truth. And then in chapter 9, verses 8 through 9, And the Holy Spirit signifying this, 
that the way into the most holy place was not yet made manifest while the first tent was standing, which was a parable for the present time, in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which are unable to perfect the one serving as to his conscience. The tent and the sacrifices are themselves a parable for this present age, as we spoke of last week. In these upcoming weeks and months, we will be exploring just this in great detail. The shadows, patterns, and parables contained in the tabernacle and its service, and just what these things can teach us about our own place in the community of Messiah. For, according to the author of Hebrews, this is exactly what these things are intended to teach us. Our place in the body of Messiah and the role of Messiah himself, all revealed in types, shadows, and parables throughout these many chapters of Exodus and Leviticus. This week we begin with several articles that were in the tabernacle and the curtains, and if we consider these things as symbols, we will discover amazing truths hidden just under the surface. One last thing before we begin. A few months back we went through the plagues three times over in order to examine them on three different levels of revelation contained in the plagues. Well, I'm going to attempt to do the same thing throughout these upcoming chapters of Exodus. We're going to examine the tabernacle on many different levels, and we're going to attempt to discern the depth of this pattern and all that it contains and what it means. But first, let's read this week's Parsha and then consider the topic for this week in relationship to the tabernacle. And that is how God approaches men. Exodus 25, 1 through 26, 30. And Hashem spoke to Moshe, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, and that they take up a contribution for me. From everyone whose heart moves him, you shall take up my contribution. And this is the contribution which you take up from them, gold and silver and bronze and blue and purple and scarlet material and fine linen and goat's hair and ram skins dyed red and fine leather and acacia wood, oil for the light, spices for the anointing oil and for the sweet incense. Shoham stones and the stones to be set in the shoulder garment and in the breastplate, and they shall make me a set-apart place, and I shall dwell in their midst. According to all that I show you, the pattern of the dwelling place and the pattern of all its furnishings, make it exactly so. And they shall make an ark of acacia wood, two and a half cubits long, a cubit and a half wide, and a cubit and a half high. And you shall overlay it with clean gold, inside and outside, you shall overlay it. And you shall make on it a molding of gold all around. And you shall cast four rings of gold for it, and put them in its four corners, two rings on one side and two rings on the other side. And you shall make poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. And shall put the poles into the rings on the sides of the ark, to lift up the ark by them. The poles are in the rings of the ark, they are not taken from it. And into the ark you shall put the witness which I give you. And you shall make a lid of atonement of clean gold, two and a half cubits long and a cubit and a half wide. And you shall make two cherubim of gold, and make them of beaten work, at the two ends of the lid of atonement. And make one cherub at one end, and the other cherub at the other end. And make the cherubim from the lid of atonement at its two ends. And the cherubim shall be spreading out their wings above, covering the lid of atonement with their wings, with their faces towards each other, the faces of the cherubim turned towards the lid of atonement. And you shall put the lid of atonement on top of the ark, and put into the ark the witness which I give you. And I shall meet with you there, and from above the lid of atonement, from between the two cherubim which are on the ark of the witness, I shall speak to you all that which I commanded you concerning the children of Israel. And you shall make a table of acacia wood two cubits long, a cubit wide, and a cubit and a half high. And you shall overlay it with clean gold, and shall make a molding of gold all around and shall make for it a rim of a handbreadth all around, and shall make a gold molding for the rim all around. And you shall make for it four rings of gold, and put the rings on the four corners that are at its four legs. The rings are close to the rim as holders for the poles to lift the table. And you shall make the poles of acacia wood, and overlay them with gold, and the table shall be lifted with them. And you shall make its dishes, and its ladles, and its jars, and its bowls for pouring. Make them of clean gold. And you shall put the showbread on the table before me continually. And you shall make a lampstand of clean gold. The lampstand is made of beaten work. Its base and its shaft, its cups, its ornamental knobs and blossoms are from it. And six branches shall come out of its sides. Three branches of the lampstand out of one side, and three branches of the lampstand out of the other side. Three cups made like almond flowers on one branch, with ornamental knob and blossom. And three cups made like almond flowers on the other branch, with ornamental knob and blossom. So for the six branches coming out of the lampstand. 
and on the lampstand itself are four cups made like almond flowers, with ornamental knob and blossom, and the knob under the first two branches of the same, and a knob under the second two branches of the same, and a knob under the third two branches of the same, according to the six branches coming out of the lampstand. Their knobs and their branches are of the same, all of it one beaten work of clean gold, and ye shall make seven lamps for it, and they shall mount its lamps so that they give light in front of it, and its snuffers and their trays are of clean gold, it is made of a talent of clean gold with all these utensils. So see and do according to the pattern which was shown to you on the mountain. And make the dwelling place with ten curtains of fine woven linen and blue and purple and scarlet material. Make them with caravim, the work of a skilled workman. The length of each curtain is twenty-eight cubits and the width of each curtain four cubits, all the curtains having one measure. Five curtains are joined to each other and five curtains are joined to each other. And you shall make loops of blue on the edge of the end curtain on one set, and do the same for the edge of the end curtain on the other set. Make fifty loops in the one curtain, and make fifty loops on the edge of the end curtain of the second set, the loops being opposite of each other. And you shall make fifty hooks of gold, and shall join the curtains together with the hooks, and the dwelling place shall be one. And you shall make curtains of goat's hair for a tent over the dwelling place. Make eleven curtains. The length of each curtain is thirty cubits, and the width of each curtain four cubits, one measure to the eleven curtains. And you shall join the five curtains by themselves, and the six curtains by themselves, and you shall double over the six curtains at the front of the tent. You shall make fifty loops on the edge of the curtain that is outermost in one set, and fifty loops on the edge of the curtain of the second set. And you shall make fifty bronze hooks, and put the hooks into the loops, and join the tent together, and it shall be one. And the overlapping part of the rest of the curtains of the tent, the half curtain that remains, shall hang over the back of the dwelling place, and a cubit on one side and a cubit on the other side of what remains to the length of the curtains of the tent is to hang over the side of the dwelling place, on this side and on that side, to cover it. And you shall make a covering of ram skins dyed red for the tent, and a covering of fine leather above that. And for the dwelling place you shall make the boards of acacia wood standing up, Ten cubits is the length of a board, and a cubit and a half the width of each board. Two tenons on each board for binding one to another. Do the same for all the boards of the dwelling place. And you shall make the boards of the dwelling place twenty boards for the south side, and make forty sockets of silver under the twenty boards, two sockets under each of the boards for its two tenons. And for the second side of the dwelling place, on the north side, twenty boards, and there forty sockets of silver, two sockets under each of the boards. And for the extreme parts of the dwelling place, westward, make six boards. And make two boards for the two back corners of the dwelling place. And they are double beneath, and similarly they are complete on top to the one ring. So it is for both of them, there for the two corners. And they shall be eight boards and their sockets of silver, sixteen sockets, two sockets under one board and two sockets under the other board. And you shall make bars of acacia wood, five for the boards on one side of the dwelling place, and five bars for the boards on the other side of the dwelling place, and five bars for the boards on the side of the dwelling place for the extreme parts westward, with the middle bar in the midst of the boards, going through it from end to end, and overlay the boards with gold, and make their rings of gold as holders for the bars, and overlay the bars with gold, and you shall raise up the dwelling place according to its pattern, which you were shown on the mountain. And this Parsha opens with instructions that a contribution was to be taken a free will offering taken from the goods of the people for the purpose of building this dwelling place for Hashem. Now, the thing that we need to focus on here is that the goods, they're given willingly. No one was forced or compelled to give. It was a personal matter. It's a personal choice. And building a dwelling place for God in our midst is something that must be entered into voluntarily. No one should be compelled to begin the process of conforming to the will of God through anything other than their own free will choice to conform themselves to the instructions of Hashem. For we have been given wills by God, and while He does desire for all humanity to enter into relationship with Him, we should not take it upon ourselves to force conversions on others who do not wish to convert, or to force obedience from those who are not ready. All we can do is reveal the instructions and let them make their own choice to respond however they wish. The process of building a dwelling place for God should only ever be entered into freely. And this underlies the entirety of this process that we will be speaking on for the next few months. And as we read in verse 8, that is the entire purpose of the tabernacle. God wishes to dwell in the midst of Israel. He wishes to be in close relationship to them, and by extension, to us. 
And so the command went out to gather the things to be used to construct each of these items that we're going to read of. And so to begin with, let's look at what was gathered for the building itself and consider what they symbolized. Now we're going to be using the list in verses 3 through 5 as our guide for these items, but we're going to stop in verse 5 this week as the remainder of the list is used for other items that we're going to read of later. So the first thing that we come across in this list is gold. And gold as a metal in the Bible, it speaks of glory and honor throughout Scripture. It symbolizes a divine nature that cannot be reproduced by man, but is so sought after and is extremely costly. Second, there's silver. Silver throughout Scripture speaks of redemption. It was silver that was used to redeem the firstborn, as well as silver that provided atonement for all who were counted in the census. These two items, plus several others throughout Scripture, reveal this truth, that silver symbolically reflects the idea of redemption. Next is bronze. Uh, this metal it speaks of judgment and justice. Now, it's probably not brass or copper, as some translations say. Uh, bronze has a melting point of 1,985 degrees Fahrenheit. It is extremely hard. Uh, bronze is an item that could withstand the fire of judgment and justice, and it, it would have worked for the altar way better than copper or brass would have. And the brazen altar, the bronze serpent, however, these and many other items reveal the truth that the bronze is judgment and justice. Then there is blue, purple, and scarlet material. And we'll speak more of these when we get to the curtains. Fine linen. Linen speaks of purity and holiness. Uh, I, I split this one out from the other fabrics used for the curtains and the garments, because while it is used in those things, there are several items that are made up of only fine linen. And so while righteousness and purity is interwoven into the curtains and the garments, we will see it represented by itself, and its brilliant white speaks of purity, cleanliness, and righteousness. Goat's hair, ram's hair, fine leather, once again we'll speak on these when we get to the curtains. Acacia. Now nearly every article in the tabernacle was constructed first with acacia wood before being overlaid with gold. Acacia, or shittim wood, is the core of nearly every item but the lamp and the labor. Acacia is a hardwood that is very heavy, indestructible by insects. Acacia is called the indestructible wood, and it speaks of an incorruptible core to each of the items created. Because it's a tree, it also speaks of having roots in the earth that have been removed and that have been then shaped to be used for service to God. Now, each of these elements, they have a symbolic meaning. And as we proceed through the various items and parts, these symbols will help to provide a depth of meaning to these various items. Now, on to the tabernacle itself. Now, if it feels to you like I am flying through this, frankly, it's because I am. And I apologize for any of the thunder that makes it through onto this recording. Um, but if it feels like I'm flying through this, it's because I am. There is a lot to cover today, and only so much time in which to do so. So I opened with the dwelling place itself is no more, right? Chances are that we'll never get to experience this thing or its service in any physical way. And for 2,000 years, we haven't been able to. And yet, the authors of the New Testament give us pointers to a deeper truth that we should not miss. 1 Corinthians 3, 16-17. Do you not know that you are a dwelling place of God, and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone destroys the dwelling place of God, God shall destroy him. For the dwelling place of God is holy, which you are. 2 Corinthians 6.16 And what union has the dwelling place of God with idols? For you are a dwelling place of the living God, as God has said. I shall dwell in them, and walk among them, and I shall be their God, and they shall be my people. Or Ephesians 2, 21-22, In whom all the building, being joined together, grows into a holy dwelling place in Hashem, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. The temple is no more. The tabernacle is no more. And yet these verses speak of the dwelling place of God in a new way. So where is the dwelling place of the Most High God of Israel in this age? It's in us. 
It's in our midst. It's in our hearts. It's in our community. It's in the people of God. And it manifests itself both individually and communally simultaneously. And so we need to be aware of both as we proceed, even though we're only going to be covering one aspect of this today. Now, for in this text, we will discover something that is absolutely fascinating when we consider that the tabernacle is, in fact, a shadow of the ecclesia or the church of Yeshua. The tabernacle teaches us about what it means to be part of that body of Messiah. But when we also realize that each one of us individually, we're also pictured in this dwelling, and that the shadow teaches us of our personal relationship, well, <laughs> then we have plenty to speak on. And so this week we're going to be focusing primarily on our individual relationship with the Most High. We will speak on those communal aspects in later teachings. And so when we turn to this last part of the book of Exodus, we discover that the tabernacle is spoken of four times in succession throughout these last chapters. One, there are the instructions given from the mouth of Hashem for the construction of the tabernacle. And this is going to cover chapters 25 through 31 of Exodus. Second, there's the building of the individual parts of the tabernacle, which was recorded in Exodus 35 through 39. Third, then comes the command to assemble the tabernacle. And then comes the act of assembling the tabernacle as the fourth, both of those being found in Exodus 40. Now, these four times that it goes through the tabernacle, they give us a fascinating insight. Both of the times that God gives the instructions for the tabernacle, whether it begins in 25 or it begins in chapter 40, the instructions always begin with the Ark of the Witness. But when the men actually work to accomplish the task that's set before them by God in Exodus 35 and the last half of Exodus 40, men always begins with the structure of the tabernacle. And in this, we discover a truth that's not a secret. It's, it's a truth that's been recognized by scholars and teachers for centuries. When God approaches man, he begins in the innermost part, and then he works his way outward. But when men approach God, we always begin on the outside, and we work our way in. Now, this is not a problem. There is no issue here. This is simply the way that we have been created, and it's the way that we will act in relationship to God. And we see this truth reflected in several places, but I want to point out one that's in Acts chapter 2. Now, on the day of Pentecost, when the Spirit fell and the apostles spoke in tongues, Peter gives a long speech to those within his hearing. And at the end of the speech, he says this in Acts chapter 2, verse 37. It says, And having heard this, they were pierced to their hearts, the act of God beginning in the center. And they said to Peter and the rest of the emissaries, Men, brothers, what shall we do? The men begin with the response of men. How can I act in response to this act of God that began on the inside? God begins in men through reaching their innermost, but men respond to God by attempting to act in the right way. And this is as it should be. This is the pattern of the tabernacle that we see laid out here in the book of Exodus. But now with this pointer, we can then infer that it is the set of instructions when compared to each of us individually, and with the realization that the tabernacle provides symbols that describe reality, that the Ark of the Witness is a symbol of our hearts. Ephesians 3, 17-19, it says that the Messiah might dwell in your hearts through faith, having become rooted and grounded in love, in order that you might be strengthened to firmly grasp with all the holy ones what is the width and the length and the depth and the height to know the love of Messiah which surpasses knowledge, in order that you might be filled to all the completeness of God. Now here in Ephesians 3, Paul tells us explicitly that our heart is to be the dwelling place of the Messiah, and the place where it all begins, and that this truth will be revealed to us through the width and the length and the depth and the height of the love of Messiah. And the pattern of the tabernacle, with all of its lengths and widths and so on, gives us a way of seeing into that. 
this revelation of the truth of the tabernacle, it's greater than knowledge. It's greater than the written word. Why? So that we might be indwelled with the fullness of God. Exodus chapter 40, verse 34. And the cloud covered the tent of appointment, and the honor of Hashem filled the dwelling place. So what is the ark, this holy crate or box? Well, the human heart is composed of two lobes, and the ark as well, it has two main parts. It has the box, and it has the lid. And we'll get to those pieces in a moment. First of all, what was in the ark? What existed in the ark? Now, it's commonly thought that there were three items in the ark, and that's been based off of a reading of Hebrews 9. In Hebrews 9, verse 34, it says, And after the second veil, the part of the tent which is called the Most Holy, to which belonged the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid on all sides with gold, in which were put the golden pot that held the manna, the rod of Aaron that budded, and the tablets of the covenant. The thing is, is that this verse could be read in two ways. The most common understanding is that the rod and the jar were in the ark, but then this verse may simply indicate that these things were in the Holy of Holies alongside the ark. So basing our understanding of this on this one verse, it's, it's tentative at best, especially when there are other verses that also speak on this. For example, in Exodus 16, verse 34, the command is for the jar of manna to be placed before the witness. And the same goes in Numbers 17.10 with Aaron's budded rod. It was to be placed before the witness. And then there's one more verse which I think solves the dilemma and does it quite explicitly. And that's in 2 Chronicles 5 verse 10, where it says, There was nothing in the ark but the two tablets which Moses had put there at Horeb, when Hashem made a covenant with the children of Israel when they came out of Egypt. The only two things in the Ark of the Covenant were the two tablets of the covenant. This is the Word of God treasured up in our hearts. Psalm 119 verse 11 says, I have treasured up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Psalm 37 31, the Torah of God is in his heart and his steps do not slide. Psalm 40, verse 8, I have delighted to do your pleasure, O my God, and your Torah is within my heart. Or Jeremiah 31 through 33, For this is the covenant I shall make with the house of Israel after those days, declares Hashem. I shall put my Torah in their inward parts and write it on their hearts, and I shall be their God, and they shall be my people. Or 2 Corinthians 3, 2 through 3, you are our letter, having been written in our hearts, known and read by all men, making it obvious that you are a letter of Messiah, served by us, written not with ink, but by the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on fleshly tablets of the heart. According to this pattern that is expanded throughout Scripture, the law of God is to be in our hearts, and that is the picture that we're given here. It is when this happens that we are said to have a heart of flesh rather than a heart of stone. Now, the tablets of the covenant are to be in our hearts, but what is the other half of this? In the English, the lid of the ark is called the mercy seat, but that is an inaccurate translation that is based solely on tradition. The Hebrew word for the lid of the ark is the kipparet. And it's a word that finds its root in the word kafar. And kafar is the word that's translated as atonement. It was the kippah that had the blood sprinkled on it for atonement on Yom Kippur, the one and the only thing that the high priest was to do once a year in the Holy of Holies. And in Hebrews 10.22 we read, Let us draw near with the true heart and completeness of faith, having our heart sprinkled from a wicked conscience, and our body washed with clean water. Now we'll talk about this process and the meaning of atonement at a later date, but for now, let's examine what this reveals. The ark itself, which is a picture of our hearts, contains in it the tablets of the testimony. And placed over those tablets also as a part of our hearts is the reality of atonement. And then above these both, there are two angelic beings known as cherubim. 
And if we do a word study on the Kerovim, we discover that they are the protectors of God's throne. They are the heavenly beings who were placed at the east of Eden to prevent man from entry into the holy space of the garden once man had transgressed the instructions of God. The beings, they are also the beings who are seen in prophetic visions as the guardians of the throne and who carry out the judgment of God in Ezekiel 9 and 10. And it is these who protect and judge the heart of Israel who have God enthroned in their heart, who have the witness written within, and who have atonement covering all. And inside of the Holy of Holies, not specifically mentioned here, were those other two items, the things that were treasured near the ark, but not in it, and that we should always keep close to our hearts. One being a jar of manna, that is the symbol of God's provision at all times, and two being the budded staff of Aaron, which is a symbol of the authority of the high priest that can bring life to the dead, that dead staff that budded with life. Now these two things alongside the words of the covenant and the covering of atonement, they are to be in the holy place, that innermost place within us. So let's look back over this. We have the heart with the words of God stored up in it. And that heart with the word of God is covered by the atoning blood of the Lamb. And right alongside that is a reminder of God's provision for us at all times and of the authority that the high priest has to bring life to our dead flesh. Now that's pretty profound if you ask me. And that's just the beginning of the tabernacle. The next piece that we read of is the table of showbread. Now, the table of showbread is a table that was placed in the holy place, and it contained 12 loaves of bread that would then bask in the presence of God for an entire week before being eaten by the priests on the following Sabbath. Now, all through scripture, we see bread used as a metaphor for the word of God. Deuteronomy 8.3, for example, And he humbled you, and he let you suffer hunger, and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know to make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of Hashem. Or John 6.33, For the bread of God is he who comes down out of the heavens and gives life to the world. So they said to him, Master, give us this bread always. And Yeshua said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall not get hungry at all, and he who believes in me shall not get thirsty at all. And who is Yeshua? He is the Word made flesh. Or Isaiah 55, 1 through 3, it says, Oh, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and you who have no silver, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without silver and without price. Why do you weigh out silver for what is not bread, and your labor for what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me and eat what is good, and let your being delight itself in fatness. Incline your ear and come to me, hear so that your being lives. And let me make an everlasting covenant with you, the trustworthy covenant loyalty of David. Did you catch that? Don't buy bread which is sold for silver. Instead of bread, listen to my words. Bread and the word are throughout scripture, equated to each other in this contrast. Every week on this table, new bread was baked. And on the Sabbath, it was placed in the holy place and the priests were to eat of that bread of the last week. And we see here the pattern of what we do weekly, of what everybody who goes to a congregation does weekly. Every Sabbath, new bread is placed before us. And for the following week, we then contemplate the bread that has been set before us. We look at it and we study the bread. And then on the Sabbath, we eat of the bread. Both physically and symbolically, we partake of the table of showbread. The table of showbread was not alone in the holy place, though. As we will read very soon, the tabernacle was enclosed and no light from outside was allowed in. The only source in the tabernacle was the menorah. And that is the next article that we read of in the tabernacle. The menorah is also representative of the spirit of Hashem that inhabits our bodies, as we read earlier. The menorah is the only article in which there is no acacia wood. It's pure gold, purely divine and glorious. There's no part of it that's rooted in the earth. 
The menorah has no dimensions given. The only instructions are for how much gold was to be used in its construction, and that it contains seven lamps. One might even say seven spirits. Revelation 1.4 says, John, to the seven assemblies that are in Asia, grace to you and peace to him who is and who was and who is coming, and from the seven spirits that are before his throne. And where is the throne? It's in the Holy of Holies. And what are the seven spirits that are before his throne? They're pictured in the menorah. Or how about Zechariah 4, 1 through 6? And the messenger who was speaking to me came back and woke me up as a man is awakened from sleep. And he said to me, What do you see? So I said, I have looked and see a lampstand, all of it with gold, with a bowl on top of it. And on the stand, seven lamps with seven spouts to the seven lamps. And two olive trees are by it, one at the right of the bowl and the other at its left. And then I responded and spoke to the messenger who was speaking to me, saying, What are these, my master? And the messenger who was speaking to me answered and said to me, Do you not know what these are? And I said, No, my master. And he answered and said to me, This is the word of Hashem to Zerubbabel, Not by might nor my power, but by my spirit, says Hashem of hosts. It is the menorah, the spirit that is to be contrasted to the bread. It is the spirit that enlightens the word that we eat. It is the spirit of Hashem that interprets the word so that it can be rightly divided. And together, these seven spirits work together to bring light to the inward being of a man. What are those seven spirits of God? What are they, you might ask? Well, if we turn to Isaiah 11, 2, I think we read of them there, where it says, The spirit of Hashem shall rest on him that being the central spirit of it all, the spirit of the Lord. There's the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, spirit of knowledge and the fear of Hashem. Wisdom, understanding, counsel, might, knowledge, and the fear of Hashem. Those six together combine to form that seventh spirit that is the spirit of Hashem that was to rest on the Messiah according to Isaiah 11.2. This is the same Spirit that was poured out on the Apostles on the day of Pentecost. This is the same Spirit that's been given to each one of us. Now there is one other item that is in the holy place of the tabernacle, but it's not listed in this set of instructions that we read today. In fact, it's the very last piece of the tabernacle that we're going to read. And this is the altar of incense. And in the parable, we get a picture of the Spirit shining its light on this as well. And we see all through Scripture that incense is a symbol of prayers rising before the throne of Hashem. Now, I'm not going to get into this particular item now, as we'll be spending an entire lesson on just this item and what we can learn from it in four weeks. So, as we consider what we've learned, we discover something of mind-blowing proportions. The Shema, the prayer that is recited every day in Judaism and in many Christian homes, is modeled after the tabernacle. And it is the tabernacle that gives us insight into just how to live out the Shema in our homes. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar, the Shema is found in Deuteronomy 6.4, where it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your resources. Usually it says might, but the Hebrew word there literally means your everythingness. So, your resources is how I understand it. So what are those three things that we're told to love Hashem, our God, with? Well, there's our heart. The Holy of Holy is that innermost place, the place with the words of the covenant, the place with the atonement to cover, the authority of the high priest who brings life and the knowledge that God provides for our needs. Next is our soul, or our nefesh, the holy place. And when we understand that the word nefesh is not speaking of an intangible energy that runs through us, but rather it speaks of all that makes us who we are, then the holy place is analogous to our nefesh. And loving God with all of our nefesh includes taking in the word of God and allowing the Holy Spirit to indwell us and sending prayers up before the throne on a daily basis. And then our resources, the outer courtyard, which we'll speak of next week, All of those things that are within our realm of influence. And in this we see how it is that God works in each one of us as we grow to know Him more. And each of these things speaks of our inward reality. 
So as we consider this, then the items that are to be used to build that tent, the curtains and boards, they speak of our bodies in some way. And this area was one of the areas that I had the hardest time understanding just what the instructions were speaking of. I actually had to draw out plans for the tabernacle to get an idea of what it would look like. And while doing so, I discovered that I was actually wrong in several areas of my understanding of what it was speaking about, what it would look like, how it was executed. It's not just me, though. The thing that precipitated this drawing was because I was doing a bunch of research through different scholars about what people had to say about the tabernacle. And as I looked, so much of it conflicted with each other. There's no consensus as to how this was supposed to be done. So I did it myself. I broke it down and I actually drew a blueprint for the tabernacle. Just how would this building have been assembled? So then chapter 26, it opens with a set of curtains. The innermost curtain, the first in the list, was one that did not touch the ground. It was made of woven linen and blue, purple, and scarlet thread. Yarn. Now this would have been made with a wool and linen mixture. This command against a mixture that we read of in Leviticus 19 and Deuteronomy, it's not a universal command that wool and linen are never to be woven together. Because we read here when we read in Exodus 28 and a couple other places that this mixture was to be used for creating the cloth that was used in several areas of the tabernacle. And this mixture, it's a holy mixture. It's one that's reserved solely for the service to Hashem. Now, I see a lot of people out there talking about frequencies or how durable the cloth is or trying to come up with a hundred of other reasons as to why Hashem forbids this mixture. Now, the truth is, is that it's holy. And just like the anointing oil and the incense mixture that we're going to read of later, these items are reserved for singular use, service to Hashem not to be profaned through personal use. Now, there is one exception that we'll get into much later in the book of Numbers as to where wool and linen can be mixed in something that is worn on a person. But I'm not going to get into that today. Now, the colors of this mixture, they're significant as we find the same color mixture not only in the innermost curtain, but also in the veil that separates the Holy of Holies from the holy place. The holy place from the outer courtyard the high priest's shoulder garments, and the regular priest's girdle. Now, the blue thread represents the purity of the heavens, the dwelling place of Hashem. Now, think back on the stones at his feet during the covenant meal in chapter 24 that we read of last week. The red represents the blood of mortals and the sacrifice of the atonement. The purple represents the mixture of these two as God and man met together, which is epitomized in the Messiah, the king who is clothed in purple robes. Now, this inner cloth in this is symbolic of our mortal body, which is the red, which is continually striving up to the heavens, which is the blue. And in the joining of the two of God and man, as we enter into fellowship with God in the purple. Now, this curtain is not visible to anyone outside of the tent. The only ones who ever saw this curtain were the priests. And they only saw it on the ceiling. They didn't see it on the sides. The next curtain that covers this one is one that's made from a goat. Now, it's assumed that this curtain still had the hair of the goat still attached to it, which would have made it scraggly, would have made it furry. The goat hair curtain bears within itself the symbol of sacrifice and judgment. These two pieces are joined together symbolic of the Day of Atonement and the two goats that were involved, one goat to make atonement and the other goat to carry the skins away. They're joined together in judgment. And it's in this place situated between our spiritual body and our physical body that judgment and sacrifice occurs. Judgment based on the union of our thoughts and wills and intentions and our works, deeds, and words. It's not a judgment of works or a judgment of thoughts and will. It's a judgment of both. And it's symbolized in the inside of the tabernacle and in that inner body man at the woven curtains and the outer courtyard and that outermost curtain of just pure leather. Now, this curtain, it did reach all the way to the ground on all sides, and it speaks of its earthly nature. But the only place that it was visible was at the entrance, where four cubits of this cloth would overhang the entrance on all sides, and then it was doubled back on itself. Now, the final pair of curtains are the ones that everyone would see. It's two sets of skins. The outer skin was revealed to the world. And there are two curtains here. 
One is a goat skin, which speaks of the covering that God gave to Adam and Eve, as well as the skins of the Ola sacrifice that the priests received as part of the burnt offering. This skin is thought to have overhung the other curtains and to have been snug up to the sides of the tabernacle, and it would have been dyed red. Now, the outermost skin, then, was a plain color. It was, it was actually probably uninteresting to look at. And this curtain only gets half of a verse, and it's translated in many ways, including a porpoise skin, a badger skin, the skin of a sea cow, or a ram skin. And no one's really sure what kind of skin was used for this outer layer, but it was not beautified in any way. It was plain, it was waterproof, it was functional. This is a distinct departure from the ways of the pagan nations, which would have made beautiful temples in order to entice people to come into them. This skin was then thought to be staked out to the sides for the water to run off, which would have left an opening between the body of the tabernacle itself and this outer skin on the sides. Now, it should be no surprise for any of us that the holy dwelling place of Hashem would be a place with no form or majesty or beauty to attract us to it. Isaiah 53, 2 says, For he grew up before us as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or splendor that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should desire him. The tabernacle itself had no form or appearance that anyone would actually desire to go in and worship based on its looks. Because we don't seek relationship with Hashem because of what it looks like on the outside, but because of the beauty that is contained when you enter into his presence. For it's man that looks on the outside, as 1 Samuel 16, 7 says, And Hashem said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or at the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For not as man sees. For man looks at the eyes, but Hashem looks at the heart. Next in the order of the text is the boards and the sockets. Now, for the longest time, I pictured these boards as being put down on a floor for the priests to walk in, but they're not. They are vertical boards that provided the structure of the tent, and they would have been on three sides, the north, south, and the back side, the, the west side of the tabernacle. So they provide the structure for the tent. They are what held up these skins. And as we view this set of instructions through the lens of our own personal lives, these are the bones that hold us up in one way or another. They're that which supports our flesh and gives it its form. And we see the idea of bones being raised up and brought to life in Ezekiel 37. This passage usually being understood as a communal putting together of many pieces into one. But it can also be understood in our personal level of our own lives as we're called by Hashem and we're caused to stand before Him. And then we're clothed with skin on the outside and filled with His Spirit on the inside. Now, I hope it has not escaped your attention that each of these levels is also symbolic for the body of Messiah, which we will cover in a later teaching as well as being symbolic for the communal aspect of the greater body, which, again, we will also cover in a greater detail in a later teaching. But it's in this metaphor, the community, that the boards and the sockets take on their most profound meaning, as it is this that gives the individual the support that they need to stand. In verse 15, the boards are described as standing up. Think on those dry bones that stood up. And the word used for standing is amad. And we see this word used in Scripture to reflect the idea of abiding or enduring something or having the strength to withstand storms and winds. But there's another interesting turn of phrase in verse 17. In many translations, we read that they are set in order one against the other. Uh, the ESV says simply it's for fitting together. The NET simply says they are parallel to one another. The Septuagint says something along the lines of they are answering the one to the other. And in the Hebrew, it literally says, and equally connected each one to its sister. The word for connect is yadot, which is a word that means hands, if we take it literally. And so we can see from this that the body of Messiah is to be one of sisters and brothers, equally joined with each other, hand in hand, side by side, supporting one another as we build a tabernacle for the Most High in our midst. Ephesians 2, 19-22 So then you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens of the Holy Ones and members of the household of God, having been built upon the foundation of the emissaries and the prophets, 
Yeshua Messiah himself being chief cornerstone, in whom all the building, being joined together, grows into a holy dwelling place in Hashem, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. The boards, just like so many other pieces, were made of acacia wood covered with gold, and when put in place, there were no gaps. They formed walls of gold in the tabernacle through which the curtains could not be seen. And these boards were supported through the use of silver sockets. Again, remember, silver being the symbol of redemption. And the silver for these sockets, we'll find out later, they were sourced from the census that we read of in Numbers through the half shekel that the people gave to atone for themselves at that time. The foundation for the entirety of the tabernacle is found in the redemption of every member of the community. And each board individually finds its foundation in its own socket, its own individual redemption. And on the personal level, we find out our own personal foundation and redemption. But our support comes when in union with others who also stand on a foundation of redemption. And with the boards covered in gold, we see that those in community take on the divine holiness when incorporated into the dwelling place of God. And at the core of that divine holiness is incorruptibility that once found its source in the earth, the tree, the acacia tree, but now finds its identity in the tent. And from here into the courtyard, we find that our personal outward expression is to use all within the area of our influence with the attitudes of cleanliness and judicious sacrifice, symbolized in the laver, the wash basin, and the brazen altar. And those on the outside, what will they see? From the outside, the only thing that they see is clean linen surrounding all that you are, with a single doorway that is blue and purple and red. More on that in another lesson. So people, as they came, they see towering above them these walls of purity and a building beyond it that's nothing special to look on. And they see the presence of God ascending from heaven to the holy place, coming down to touch earth. And they see the smoke that ascends to the Father from the altar on the other side of the courtyard. And that's all that should be visible to those who look on our life from the outside, when Hashem has created in you a space to dwell. And in this set of instructions, we discern the order in which God approaches His people when He chooses to dwell with them. He gives instructions on what to do, and when He does, He starts on the inside. He starts with the heart. And from the heart, His instructions will work outward into the nefesh. Instructions that include prayer, the cloud that ascends in our inward parts, the cloud that is guided by the Spirit and the Word. And the Spirit brings an inward light to the place that was once only darkness, and the true bread of life that is marinated in God's presence. The words that we think on weekly as the Spirit illuminates the Word, and the taste is influenced by our prayers. All of this is contained in a structure that's not pretty from the outside, but contains marvelous wonders. And from there, God gives instructions on how to live lives of sacrifice and cleanliness within our realm of influence and in our lives. And this building, this building reflects our own lives as people who have been redeemed, who have come to the foot of the mountain, who have spoken the words, all that Hashem has said we will do, and who have entered into covenant with Him. Lives built on the foundation of redemption, upheld through unity with others who have put on the incorruptible and divine, surrounding articles of life with God and all that is needed and necessary to dwell with Him. For that is what He seeks, and that is what we seek. And in the tabernacle, we discover how this can be accomplished. And this week we looked at what it looks like for God to approach man, the form that his instruction takes as it begins, and the path that it takes as it works in us. Next week we're going to re-enter the tabernacle once again, and this time we're going to be examining the way in which mankind approaches God, the path that we should take as we seek to dwell with him, 
the path that responds to the pricking of our hearts with the question of, what then shall we do? For the tabernacle contains so many patterns within, all overlaid with each other, and each of the various levels is just as profound and enlightening as the previous. And so as we study this excellent building, I pray that the depths that are revealed within this building help us all to enter into the work of creating in our midst, both personally and communally, a place for the Most High to dwell. For this is not something that is done for the community of God. It is a process that begins with instructions. But it is what the community of God does according to the pattern that we've been given. It is our work that we have been tasked with. And so let's follow these blueprints in ourselves and in our communities and build a dwelling place for our God. Because these blueprints, they reveal the way of life. And as we derishchai, as we seek life, having a map and a blueprint, <laughs> well, that's a really good place to start. Shalom. Thank you for tuning in to Deresh Chai. If this content has blessed you and you would like more, please consider subscribing, liking, commenting, and sharing with others. To find out more about what we do and to support this ministry, head over to SeekLifeSC.com. That's SeekLifeSC.com. We'll see you again next time as we Deresh Chai, as we seek life. Shalom.